Boom. Welcome once again. My name is Steve Jaguer. And his co-host, Mike Foster. Welcome once again to your cloud native video newsletter for your impatient world, where we distill the best curated content from throughout the week or weeks, depending on how long it's been since we last did a show. All things security, cloud native Kubernetes, big acquisitions, things just make you go, what? And of course, a technical section where we have a special guest today. Yes, a couple of weeks past New Year, but Happy New Year, and thanks for joining back. We have special guests coming in to talk uh, Rancher, do a little demo. We're going to quiz them a little bit about what's new and what's coming up in the year. And we're going to be talking a lot about uh, some open source corruption stuff, some devs up to some... Uh, uh, anyways, good talk. And then we're going to uh, take a look. People are still using USBs to hack you, so watch out for that one. And <laughs> some... Uh, <laughs> some new startups that we wanted to uh, get into discuss in the new year. So yeah, thanks for joining. We better perform well because I can see Bastion in the green room. Yeah. He's watching. Yeah, he's waving at us. So it just be cool. Be cool. Mm -hmm. How's your new year? Uh, new year's going well. Everybody's doing well. Family safe, family's uh, healthy. And we're back here with the show. So I'm super excited. How about you? Yeah, not bad. I managed to avoid all family over the uh, holiday time. So again, success. They never watch this show, so it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the nice thing I take a little break is we get uh, a pretty good lineup of topics. That's that's true, actually. That's really true. Somehow I got a before you get started. I got a question for you. Shoot. Surprise question. I got sent a swag pack. It arrived today, and I want to see if you can identify the swag. All right. So th this two items. What are these things? This now. The, I'm, I'm sort of plugging it, but what is this? Uh, that looks like one of the things that go in the back of your phone. For, and it's well, it's on that. It is. It is one of those things, or it's a pedestal for your pest dispenser. <laughs> Maybe it's that. <laughs> okay, it's one of those. Or this is the thing I actually legitimately can't figure out. I knew what that was. This is this got sent to me from Sysdig. Oh, but look at like, it. It's got like. Yeah, but it's got yeah, it's got like this stretchy stuff on it. Okay, is it like an oven mitt? Is that what it is? But mouse it's pad. like, well, I, that's not yeah. a mouse pad. That's just the back of something. This is just this is like elasticated stuff. And damn pop like, something. Be like, uh, what is this? What the heck is this thing? I don't know what that is. So I don't know. That's the answer. I don't know what the heck that is. Thanks, Sistig, for this. But in the uh, WTF section. <laughs> it's WTF section. No idea what I just got there. Yeah. Uh, all right. Anyway, there's there's the there's the early quiz for the show. Uh, do you want to get into it, or we got anything else? Uh, no, let's do it. We got uh, we, we got to get through a bunch of stuff before uh, Bashi comes on. So yeah, where he, he takes it. over. That's that yeah. makes this an easy show, provided we don't screw it up before he gets here. 
Oh, yeah. So. All right. Number. Oh, we had general news. General news. We have uh, a sting now for that. Hot off the it's press. Burning, it's all burning down. Appropriate for this one. Mm-hmm. Dev Krupp's NPM Libs Colors and Faker, very commonly used, uh, intentionally corrupted his own open source so that anybody who used them printed out gibberish. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool because he was, there you go, there's our gibberish. And then, liberty, liberty, liberty. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing because it didn't affect me. Yeah, it's like a V for Vendetta skit or something like that. It, it, yeah, a very, very low budget one. But yeah, it, it, it messed up the end AWS CDK amongst all sorts of other things, which is, but he did it out of protest, right? It was, it kind of reminded me of Elastic a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Protesting, I guess, big corpse using open source and not giving back. I'm curious and how so, this didn't get picked up. Because even though you're corrupting it, you still got to, you know, merge with the main branch and it has to be built. Has to be pushed out. Well, he's the maintainer, so he just he, he did it. And he committed. Did. He, he committed to master, I think, and off mm-hmm. we go. Yeah. That's hilarious. It is, and, and yet a bad idea at the same time. Don't do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's interesting how open source has some of the same risks associated with managing your own software, right? Oh, you have some sort of uh, disgruntled employee, and they go and want to burn everything down on the way out. A little, yeah. A little he did. He did make a lot of political callouts. I'm not going to get into all of them, but it's kind of nuts. I suppose the big lesson we need to learn is that never use version six 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 of any software. <laughs> Probably bad. A little <laughs> sense of irony there. Yes, yes, that's a red flag. Just jump yeah. from six six five to six six seven. Let that one. Let that one go. So, if you're using those libraries, watch out. Yeah, using those. I mean, they're all. I don't know what's going on anymore. Oh, we it have was, a list. Uh, yeah, you know, coming up. Was it the next? Oh, one? yeah, a list. If you uh, if you're interested. All right, all right. So Christoph, Christoph is a guru. Let's bring it up. This is a blog you should just follow, because it seems like anytime I need to find something smart related to cloud security, he's got a blog about it. And in this one, this is very timely for the new year. Cloud security breaches and vulnerabilities. 2021 in review. Uh, and we don't have time to go through all this. We were going to do our own list. And in the process of doing that, I just found his and thought, no, oh, his is going to be better than ours anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, he's got all the right ones in here. Code, Cove. Microsoft's big uh, ones. Remember their... Uh... Microsoft big ones, yeah. Glassdoor leaking, I am user access key. It's If you want to kind of see the year in review... This is the this is the spot. He's, he's got it all broken into. He's got it all broken into categories. Uh, I still love this. How? How? How are people still leaving S three buckets just wide open when that's not the default anymore? You I have to put effort into this now. There is, but uh, if you go, if you were to create S three buckets in the UI, it's very easy because of like you can open it in a couple areas to like think you've configured it figured it to have something monitoring and then really you're leaving the back end right. i have uh, seen that it's my guess okay. but that's your guess i mean or it's just somebody who drops everything in and then realizes their you know boss is like hey share this and they just open it wide up and uh, that could be yeah i think i only do s3 buckets in terraform so i don't really i don't click buttons anymore yep yeah all right there. so there we go and uh, if Check you're that watching, out. yeah, it's all on YouTube. All the links cataloged and archived for you to uh, to check out. Yeah. So if there's anything we're talking about, and you want to learn more? Check us out on YouTube in the links. And I just have to remember: did I put them in this one? I hope so. But I'll put them in afterwards if they're not there now. They'll be there. All right. You added this one. Is it yeah, controversial? It's not really. I think it was more of a a questionnaire for people to to see what their thoughts are. When Bastion comes on, we have to ping on what his thoughts. But uh, our ca- this comes up all the time. Our container is less secure than VMs in practice. And I think the in practice part is the <laughs> big change to the question, right? Mm-hmm. Software-wise, no. 
I don't think there's anything that inherently makes containers less secure than VMs. Well, the defaults. The defaults, yeah. Eh, it, again, just, it, it just depends. That. It, it depends, like because now that you have uh, now, if if you're just like running container D or you're running something like Fargate, and your processes are all spawned separately, if it's just something as simple as running a bare bones container, I feel like it's probably more secure than a VM. If you're just running one, the issue comes yeah. when you get to scale and you get to configuration and and honestly, humans taking shortcuts, uh, lack of knowledge. People have been working with VMs for what twenty years. Yeah, that's where I think you're talking. Like this first guy here, if it's Fidgenix, oh, yeah. this person, uh, using a million different Docker containers with no tracking or change management. Yes, if that's what your organization is doing, that's bad. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. But the reality is there's lots of ways to track and control change management um, with containers. And in fact, containers make it super easy to detect anomalous behavior based on their simplicity and to destroy and create new ones if and to update and patch. Super easy, way easier than VMs. Yeah, and I think the the log4j was a perfect example of that, right? You can patch it. Right. If you have that process set in that like that that whole uh, software pipeline set out, it's pretty easy to update, test, and push out changes to the applications you need to. Instead of, uh, uh, I was talking to a few friends who were there around during a heartbleed, and they had to do VM mm -hmm. updates, and it was you know a whole weekend. Yeah taking things offline and then doing it in a way that still kept everything highly available versus one button push in Kubernetes now. So you got it. That is a great example, actually. Heartbleed famous in 2014, just missed the boat in terms of the containerization revolution. So, and you know what? Still out there, plenty of, plenty of hits on the Shodan search for Heartbleed. So opportunity knocks for containers to help still. Alrighty, next one. Are we in the are we in the same category still? Yeah, admission controllers. The last oh, one. Man. All right, yeah. last one in the general news. Uh, I added this one because it's. Uh, I added this one because I'm writing an admission controller at the moment, and I was fascinated just at the title. Right, detecting container drift at runtime with an admission controller. Okay, all right. So um, lots to read here and lots of techie stuff. But to summarize very quickly. They've written an admission controller, and it's probably best to, if you're familiar with manifests. Can I zoom in on this? Does it let me zoom? It does. All right. So they've got their, their webhook configuration here. What it's going to do is it's going to fire their fire their container controller um, at this root whenever anybody connects to a pod with an exec or attach and going to run something. So what that the result of that is that if you exec into a running pod, then their little, uh, very clever little package is going to then label the pod. So there'll be a label on it that says, hey, somebody exec into this. So is that intended? Probably great for production, a little dangerous outside of production. And then set a timer and yeah, say, testing. And could... yeah, testing would be bad. Pod will be evicted here. So it puts oh, it on like a timer. Yeah. So that it has a lifespan and you can set that's pretty easy actually to set up uh in kubernetes a little timer to kill it off so that's all it's that's kind of all it's doing and i was impressed with the idea of that that was what like what do you think i think that's cool i uh, yeah i mean it depends because <laughs> here's the thing let's say it's getting tagged for a time uh to be removed okay well you should probably mm -hmm. set up some sort of cron job or job to make sure that anything that gets tagged that way there's a notification or alert set out right so you nah. need like a prometheus it's like oh now there's these pods that are all tagged so i can see it in ui because i i really hope that anybody who's operating kubernetes is using a dashboard or some sort of you know config management application and not working with their thousands of services on the command line uh, the other thing too is any sort of Anytime you're deleting a pod, you need some sort of notification service. And there's a reason why certain security applications don't have break glass features like this. Like they'll notify you, but they're never going to be the ones that delete it for you. That's right. Yeah. You go, and well, you're providing value, right? If I'm deleting services and you're spending days figuring out why your services get deleted and it's your own application that you pay for, uh, it's, you know, now all of a sudden uh, it's not really doing what you want it to. So, 
There, well, I, I don't know. So maybe I can play devil's advocate here, right? So okay. ideally, you should be able to, in a chaos engineering friendly way, have a pod that gets destroyed because you have replicas. It's not going to disrupt anything, and it's just going to build a new one that hasn't been exact into. So maybe there's a little bit of safety involved there. Yeah, so I would say if you were to set it up where it's just killing the pod mm -hmm. and it's doing it right away and, so, and blasting the notification out, then it's almost like somebody sitting there anytime an exec happens and saying, no, 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 you can't get in here. Right? Yeah. And we are, we're not actually taking down the service, which is a little bit different. But mm -hmm. if I also don't really understand the whole, hey, we're going to leave it up for a specific amount of time. And like, what is this, a honeypot? We're going to let somebody do stuff in there? We're just going to tag it? Good point. I don't understand but, that either. Uh, yeah. that's that, It's, it's kind of either has to be like a break glass, like it's getting exact in, we're killing it, notification here, this is a high priority thing to go and send to, or it's just here's an alert, you guys figure out what to do with this because we don't even know if the service is useful to you or like, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on. So anyways, rambling a little bit, but uh, I think the idea is very cool. I, I think how you implement it in practice may need a little bit of a... Yeah. The two things, well, so one, one thing that I was totally intrigued by was just what it was doing, but the idea that you can do pods exec, I had no idea you could do that as as a resource in a, an admission controller. I know you could, I maybe I'm boring. I just did, I just do admission controllers on the creation of objects or the manipulation of objects, not on the exec into. I didn't, I didn't even know that was a way that, that you could do that. So mm -hmm. cool, that I learned, which is great. Uh, and then why and how? Um, well, that's a mystery, right? So what I did is I actually linked into this guy. Um, let's see if he responds. I don't have a response yet. He probably has no idea who I am. I did explain because I read your article. And I want you to come on the show and explain it. We'll see. We'll see if that happens. Yeah, maybe next week. Tune in. Maybe next week. Maybe we'll have a new, another special guest explaining uh, how that all worked. Yeah. Any all right. Crazy stuff. Yep. Do it. All right. This is this is a this for me. I threw this in here again. This was a big WTF because this felt like a this a total ops created open source project. Actually, we'll save this one in the locker for Bastion actually as well. So pay attention, Bastion. We're gonna ask you about this in a moment. Here we go. Uh config map, secret and role binding replication for Kubernetes. Like, ooh, when you say it like that, sounds awesome. Except, wait a second, what? I huh? Um, and I went digging in here, actually looking for deploy uh, to find the R back. And I'm like, well, okay, so what does it got? Yeah, okay, so it's got like carte blanche access to copy, look for all the namespaces, copy all the secrets and config maps and put them everywhere. So just propagating all the config maps and secrets to every namespace in the cluster is that other than forget useful. Is that dangerous? Seems super dangerous. The only the use case I'm thinking of is if you have some sort of storage. So if you have like, you know, maybe a highly available elastic setup and you want a mm -hmm. different secret for each one, but you don't necessarily care. Maybe it's just like like I'm looking at this one replicator, like my namespace dash one, namespace dash one. And then the next one is set up in namespace two. It's like my namespace two namespace dash two maybe you don't care if people get access to this but mm, i mean really if you're yeah. replicating secrets like this get something like vault like this shouldn't be <laughs> yeah <laughs> it'll do it for you like that's that's really yeah. what vault is designed to do you don't need to yeah but maybe this is I, the uh i agree i think the uh the open source version of this i don't want to bash it i mean this, this look at the size of the help file or the readme here, like this, whoever whoever wrote this is using it. That's why it's out there. Mm -hmm. What was the, what was the um, inspiration? I think, for it, I think it is Vault. It's just yeah. doing it without a UI and using Kubernetes native controls, which as long as it's implemented in the right way and you understand what secrets you're using, mm -hmm. because really it should be, you have secrets, they're stored at CD, they're encrypted, and then you have some sort of controller for generating them, okay. I guess the issue too now is, for example, your your secrets there, but how does the controller make sure that nothing gets pulled or like changed? Or I, I, I guess it's just it's more the workflow I'm very interested in. 
Yeah. Yeah. How do you know that? How, how do you, what if you put it in place and everything you've got is under control and then you forgot you had it there and you put a secret in that you do not want shared with other namespaces into a namespace that is where it's sharing all the secrets. Like it's, it just seems like there's a real slippery slope going on there. Yeah. yeah. All righty. <laughs> no, you're doing Move, it. Moving, moving, moving swiftly along. We have to be out of, we have to be, what time is that? How are we doing for time anyway? We have, we got five minutes to until we bring uh, Bastion in. All right. Report are likely to be charged for using view source feature in web browser. All right. You put this in and I've not even read it yet. What is it? Yes. So this was, I believe, in Kentucky, we talked Missouri. We talked about this last year and it came up and I said, WTF, this is crazy. Basically, the government published a website and in the HTML source files was a list of people that work for the government and their social security numbers. So it's not like he hacked anything. He just basically went to, up to Chrome developer tools and looked at the source code mm -hmm. and there was a bunch of data embedded in it. And <laughs> the person who found it reported it to the government, did everything All properly, right. and then basically just said, hey, by the way, this happened. So it let the government fix it first and then reported on it. And the government, the governor wants to go after them for hacking and i believe what happened was it got thrown out in a bunch of courts and then the governor's still going after them oh my goodness yeah. is that why i just rolled down and the first comment i saw was, was that. Is, yeah, pretty much <laughs> and I, I can't tell if this is like partially the governor just wants to go after this reporter or something like that or if it's just like you're Somebody you know that knows nothing about tech that like thinks it's hacking, but it's not, right? Like some people think if you go into a router because they haven't changed the admin password on it, like, that's hacking. It's like, eh, it's that's just yeah, you're not really kinda... securing your, uh, your router. Yeah, I suppose that's like being charged for breaking in or and the door's open and there's some coffee on. You're like, oh, I just came in and got some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, craziness. And I uh, hope that Governor Air relaxes a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he'll learn something from this valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. All right, moving quickly along. This is from the BBC in the United Kingdom. Alexa, tell 10-year-old girl to touch live plug with Penny. Uh, this is a real thing because you can, you can challenge. Alexa has a thing over the holidays where you can ask her to challenge. You can get it basically like an iPad. You could just, if, you do, if you're a bad parent, you just want Alexa to occupy your children. You can ask Alexa to just give your children challenges and hope that you walk in when it told your child to pull a phone charger plug half out of the wall and touch it with a penny, which apparently it pulled that challenge off the internet. Mm, what a surprise. Like most good things pulled from the internet. Uh, yeah. This is, normally we don't do, yeah, normally we don't do articles like this. We stay cloud native, but this one is cloud native. And it's dangerous. <laughs> we have different definitions of cloud native, but we, it's too yeah. funny to pass up. Yeah, when when the cloud when cloud native tries to kill children, we're still going to talk about it. Yeah, so that's I mean, pretty funny. Just don't randomly pull things from the internet in any of your applications. I think that's. I never do that. <laughs> this is basically Alexa going to Stack Overflow and grabbing the wrong thing. Like you don't copy and paste what a Stack human Overflow. would do. Never. <laughs> no, but uh, it's all legal, right? There's no copyright issues with it, doing that or yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. We have one more, right? In the WTFs conscious for time. Two. All right. We'll be quick. We'll be quick. Yeah. Four to five. This is yours. Go. Yeah. So real quick, four to five, I put this in the WTF because four to five, you would think, oh, well, if your budget, your budget could, should kind of be increasing every year, especially if there's inflation, it's like, oh, okay. It goes up 5% every year. So four to five are increasing, which is good. Congratulations, but that should basically be the default. And then <laughs> the twenty percent are dropping it. I'm yep. just really curious because we're a lot of people are going back into the office. So, you know, where is this money going? You'd think it's either going into some sort of tools. Maybe your company should get something like one password. I know a bunch of companies that still don't do that, even though everybody works remotely. Like I'm just very curious. So maybe it's just the accounting error, but you'd think that the default should be. 90 to 100 percent that are increasing their budgets so i put that yeah. in the wtf it's good it's good if i were a hacker and i could get the stats on this i'd want to find out who that 20 percent is yeah. 
Yeah, maybe some disgruntled employees got slashed and got moved out. So you, yeah, uh, bring them into your open source project. That's that's true. Yeah, Solar Winds definitely not one of those organizations decreasing their budget. Yeah, and lastly, all right. Lastly, we're back to this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this cutting edge hacking going on here. Thanks to the same people, actually, who did the thing. Remember, we reported a few weeks back about they created a fake cybersecurity company and they recruited cybersecurity experts. And actually, the whole time they were actually working on malicious stuff and they didn't know. Uh, same company. Um, gone back to basics. Yeah, you know, and it sounds like this company almost <laughs> runs like a pretty good company. They have a bunch of divisions. One <laughs> sends out USBs and other infiltrates and hacks. And maybe they have like a like a CTO or something like that. I, I feel like they'd be a great company to work for. They've probably Since got seven, some great health programs, dental. have stolen over $1 billion via various yeah. financial hacking schemes. It's crazy. They're doing, they're doing super well. I bet you they're going to get funding soon. I was going to say, we should put them in the big, <laughs> in the big spender category. <laughs> yeah, really, we should have. That's a great transition. Yeah, it's perfect. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, ba boom all right whipping through not a lot going on uh, over the holidays no investment happening but eureka former vp of product from none other than palo alto networks and her partner whose name i can't remember asaf vice cto have a plan i got got some seed funding so only eight million remember when eight million would be crazy as seed now it's like yeah your security sure here's eight million. oh yeah it's seed. it's not even series a no, wow, it's just seed. Yeah, they're pretty. I know we gotta we gotta make a website like that looks like this, that that's has right. moving stuff and exclamation points and get started button. Like that's it, I think. And and then we'll yeah, then we're good. Get eight million in uh, seed funding, and you can. It seems cloud security. That's it's. I you wouldn't know it, but it's hot. Cloud security posture. Yeah. People, uh, that's even a new thing. Security posture, posture management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, new, it's a new acronym for Gartner to latch on to. All right. That's uh, I don't know much about them, but I'll have to investigate, but that's cool. Always good to see. And here's a, like a kind of a mystery feel good one. Yeah, Nigeria. Seamless HR, $10 million to expand payroll solutions across Africa. But it is a it probably doesn't sound like it's focusing on cloud. Like why are we talking about it? But it is. Yeah. It's about investing in Africa's appetite for cloud computing software. So that's kind of cool, right? And we we reported last year too, like the, the cloud companies going and opening up uh, new services in Africa. And I think that basically that now that there is these cloud uh, locations in Africa, you have more infrastructure that people can build off of. And so this seamless HR is going to be like a cloud-based management resource. It'll be hosted on the cloud services to then be used out. So it's... Interesting, just kind of how that happens. You know, Microsoft and Google go and expand in Africa, and then it opens up, you know, companies like this to come and develop their applications. So now they have the uh, infrastructure to do it. So cool, pretty cool. I like it. And all right, right we, on for thirty minutes, right? We we did it, and we have a we have a special sting for uh, for our guest. Let's yeah, should we hit that and then bring him in. Yeah. So for the thousands in attendance. And the millions watching around the world recognize and know the world over as the people's champion of the world. Bastian Hoffman. <laughs> I think I never had such an introduction before. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. We, um, we put a lot of pressure on you stop. with that intro. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's start by just telling us what you're going to show us today, uh, and you've got half an hour about to yep. to do whatever you want. But we have some expectations. But let us know <laughs> well, what are we doing. Um, I want to show you a bit about Rancho because it was a topic already a couple of weeks ago on the show, and I think it was cut short a bit in the end. And there is a bit more things to show. 
And especially, I was also want to show a bit about the new stuff that is coming up um, with Harvestar or new product in terms of uh, HCI and a solution that you can install on your bare metal servers to get virtual machines and how to connect this with Kubernetes. And maybe then also we can talk a bit about more what's maybe coming up on the roadmap in the next months with Rancher and our cloud native ecosystem. Awesome. I got to... Depending on how it goes, I, I have set up Rancher on my bare metal server behind me, so I got okay. I need a, a good excuse to go back to it. Yeah, uh, definitely follow along. Yeah. All right, Bessin, uh, the floor is yours. So we load in your screen. Perfect. Oh, there it is. Um, what you can see here is a pre-configured Rancher instance that I just booted up a couple. Uh, Days ago or so, it has a couple clusters already prepared so that we don't have to wait for it uh, for five minutes to provision clusters later on. One of the clusters is even my Raspberry Pi sitting uh, here in the edge of my office room here, the small one, uh, where I'm running things like home assistance on and so on. Um, and for those of you who are not that familiar yet with Rancher, maybe a couple words about what it is and what it is used for. Rancher is a multi-cluster Kubernetes management tool that can be used to manage everything from one Kubernetes cluster to yeah, multiple one of them and up to thousands or even tens of thousands of clusters that you can manage with one instance and centrally within one location and one plane of glass. And the whole aim behind this is to make it easy to manage Kubernetes clusters regardless where they're running. Um, that can be clusters that are run on cloud providers somewhere in a public or private cloud. That can also be clusters that run on premise on bare metal servers or on your own virtualization solution. And this could also be clusters that run on edge devices and IoT devices like um, industry PCs in factories or um, maybe the small PC systems that they have on wind turbines to manage the wind turbine. Or we also have projects where people are running Kubernetes on trains or in self-driving cars for the entertainment systems or for the driving assistance systems. So really interesting projects. And even there, you can run Kubernetes to manage your software and you can use Rancher to manage all the different clusters and that can be quickly become thousands of clusters or even millions of clusters or across the world. Um, and of course, you can also do a combination of those. You can have setups uh, and Kubernetes clusters on cloud providers and some in your on-premise data centers and put this all into one management tool. And all the differences between the different infrastructures can be yeah, made a lot smaller because you have one management tool to manage all the different distributions, all the different Kubernetes clusters out there. When you start up with Rancher and have it installed somewhere, usually it's very quick. You can, for like a testing environment, just start up a Docker container and then you have a running Rancher instance, or you install it highly available in any kind of other Kubernetes cluster, um, and then just expose it through normal Kubernetes ingress. You have the dashboard up and running, and then you can start importing or creating additional Kubernetes clusters from within Rancher. Rancher can manage everything uh, that is yeah, CNCF certified and behaves like any other Kubernetes. So it could also be a Tanzu cluster, an OpenShift cluster, a cluster that you set up with Kube ADM or an AKS, EKS cluster, everything that speaks Kubernetes. And if it already exists, you can just import it. And then Rancher will generate you a small manifest that deploys an agent inside of your cluster, which connects back to Rancher. And then you can manage the whole cluster there. And if you want to get rid of Rancher again, you can also just delete the agent out of your cluster and you have your back, your standard vanilla Kubernetes cluster. If you don't have a Kubernetes cluster yet, it gets more interesting because you also can create new clusters. And um, for that, you have different options. You can create new clusters directly on infrastructure and cloud providers. And you can see I activated a lot of different cloud provider plugins here already. Um, also things like Equinix or Open Telecom Cloud, but also, of course, all the big ones are in there as well. And if you want to do that, you give Rancher access to the cloud provider or to your virtualization solution. And Rancher then can provision virtual machines at this cloud provider, depending on the configuration you can put in here and then install Kubernetes on it or directly go to a cloud provider and use one of the managed Kubernetes options. 
if you don't have a cloud provider and maybe you have some bare metal servers, it's also definitely possible to just say, hey, I want to create a Kubernetes cluster. And then you get an installation script generated from Rancher that you just install, run on any kind of Linux and also create it inside of, into a Kubernetes node. And just to yeah, quickly show this, how this can look at a cloud provider, I prepared this at DigitalOcean here. I already gave Rancher access to DigitalOcean. And now ah, there it loaded all the information. So I put my cloud credentials with my DigitalOcean API key in here already. And then I can give the cluster a name. I can choose how many virtual machines I want to have inside of the cluster. So let's say three. I can choose which roles these virtual machines should have in the cluster, if they should be an etcd, control plane, or worker node. And then I can choose yeah, where the how the virtual machines should be configured, in which data center and region I want to run them, which with which size, with which operating system. This is of course different between all the different cloud providers and infrastructure providers because they have different options. But what is offered there, I can also configure and choose here. What is the same for every infrastructure provider and every one of these configuration options is that you can configure the Kubernetes cluster itself. I can choose the version the CNI plugin for setting up the network. I can configure a cloud provider integration so that I can get, get directly load balancers and persistent volumes from the cloud provider. And then I can configure everything around networking, etcd, backup, schedules, upgrade strategies um, directly from here. And when I click create, the virtual machines get created. And the cluster gets created, and in uh, one, two, three, four, five minutes, I should have a cluster up and running. What is then very interesting, and also one of the yeah, big reasons why organizations worldwide use Rancher, is that you not only have the visibility inside of the clusters, and you can provision and manage these clusters, you can also provision and manage which users and groups in your organization can have access to the, your clusters in a central way. Um, access control in Kubernetes is oftentimes a bit, like at least in standard vanilla Kubernetes, is a bit yeah, not the nicest thing. You can use OpenID, but it's hard to set up and you can't really use your Active Directory or LDAP directly. So it's really complicated and we try to make this easier. Globally within Rancher, you can set up and configure the authentication provider of your choice, and we support a huge variety of them. And once you did this, you have all your users and groups from this authentication provider available. And then centrally within Rancher, you can configure with a role, also a role-based access control system, what permissions should have these users or groups have within Rancher. For example, should they be able to create new clusters or not? And you can also centrally configure which permissions should every user or every group have in which cluster. So you can say you have 10 clusters and maybe five development clusters, five production clusters. And uh, on the production clusters, all the developers of your organization only have read access, but on the dev clusters, they have full access and can do everything. Um, and you can not only do this on a per cluster level, but of course also on a per namespace level to even segment a cluster. Um, into different segments and give different permissions depending on the namespace where your applications and pods and containers and resources are. And a lot of these roles are already built in, but you even can create your own role configurations to go down onto the Kubernetes API resource level and create then the role configuration you need if you need more granular permissions than what is offered out of the box. Instead of the cluster, in the end, it's standard Kubernetes role-based access control. Um, so it's nothing Rancher specific. The great thing though, is that you can configure this all centrally and you don't have to click within like 50 clusters and create 100 different cluster role bindings and cluster roles and everything. Goes maybe back also to the tool you showed earlier where uh, it was syncing cluster roles and cluster role bindings through different namespaces. I can even see kind of a use case for that because you don't want to replicate all these resources in 50 different namespaces. That could make it easier. But here, Rancher would tell you do this for you. You just configure this once centrally and Rancher rolls this out and keeps it up to date to all clusters. 
And it also not only rolls it out, you also have central visibility and central auditing mechanisms. So I can click on a user, I can see which permissions I have globally, which permissions I have in each cluster and in each project and namespace in each cluster. And of course, if I switch on audit logging, also the same user information from my Active Directory is also passed down to the logs, uh, which is also very a very nice thing. And it may look yeah, like not much, but this is, a, especially if you run Kubernetes in enterprises, that can be a huge game changer, um, especially also if you run it on-premise or in a hybrid environment. Yeah, and real quick, the nice thing mm -hmm. too is it says user, your default admin. If I was a user, like a dev user, and yeah. I would, I can be set up access to the dashboard and I would only see my resources that I'm allocated in yep. the dashboard, correct? Yeah, which correct. is awesome. Obviously, as a yep. default admin, when you start running hundreds of clusters, it's going to be great, but then yep. <laughs> you get to kind of just show what people are, what, what they, the information that they need yeah. in their data. Uh, de right? Definitely. And also, we we have large customers. Um, I think we'll kind of talk about like um, Ubisoft, for example, the game gaming provider is a very large customer of ours and they're running, I think, already hundreds or even thousands of clusters uh, within one rancher management server. So having robust access control is also very important, but also having a central pl plane of glass where you see everything can help a lot to make sense of all these clusters here. Um, yeah, but you not only can configure access control, you have also a nice dashboard to see what is happening inside of your cluster. And for that, I already prepared this demo cluster so that, that we don't have to wait the one, two more minutes for the digital ocean cluster to come up. So if I click on one of these clusters, I get a nice dashboard that gives me an overview of what is happening inside of my cluster. Um, like basic information, how many resources I've in there, how many nodes, what is the capacity. I also directly, um, if I have the monitoring activated for the Rancher for this cluster, I get uh, firing alerts. So I broke a couple of things in my cluster there so that we can see some alerts in here. I directly have access to the basic metrics of the cluster, how my cluster is doing, how my workloads is doing, are doing, how my nodes are doing. And I can, if I don't want to use the Kubernetes API, directly start uh, interacting with my Kubernetes cluster through a nice web UI. Um, so I don't have, to, as a, especially as a developer, if I quickly want to boot up a container, I don't have to learn Kubernetes YAML. I also can directly say, hey, I want to create an Nginx image somewhere in my cluster. I can maybe configure pull secrets if it's coming from a private registry. Pull secrets would also be one of the few use cases where I think it could be beneficial to have this secret sync mechanism if you don't want to configure the secrets directly at container D level also. Um, yeah, you can create then open up ports, directly create services from here. So you have all the capabilities that Kubernetes have, has. Of course, the whole Kubernetes YAML is not hidden. You can still see this. You can still edit this YAML if you want to. And of course, you can also still use your kubectl, your CSD tools, like all of this is not hidden. The UI is just an additional um, yeah, possibility that you have to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. Usually, for privately, I am, when I'm deploying something, I'm much rather using I'm using automation and CI/CD pipelines. But I found that such a UI is especially beneficial if I want to quickly debug something, because when something is wrong and I want to quickly go to the logs, it can be much easier to say, "Okay, let's look at all the pods. Oh, I have quite a few in there, so let's filter maybe for, um, yeah, let's say." the harbor pods I have in here for my container registry. And then I can quickly look in here, have a look at the logs and have the logs. Okay, this one doesn't seem to have any logs, yay. Uh, great. It's not Every demo much. is cursed. Yeah. Okay, um, I but I can, I can look at the logs uh, directly here, uh, directly from the UI. Ah, here. Okay, I found a container that actually locks something. Um, and then I can switch between different locks here, aggregate them together very easily. If I wanted to, I can also open up a shell inside of the container directly from the UI. I can all do all of that with kubectl. It just gets a lot easier um, when you click around there. And of course, also, um, since I have a UI where I can, can click around, a lot of the resources in the, that are in the cluster are directly linked together. 
So if I have an ingress here, um, I directly have a link also to the service that is targeted by the ingress. I can click on it. I get to the service detail page. I directly see which pods are behind the service and what is their state. Um, that also makes yeah clicking around a lot easier instead of copy and pasting these pod and service names. Um, yeah, so that is in there. Um, it's everything as well can be downloaded as a YAML even after a configuration. Yeah, sure, too, right? sure. Which to me, I think is awesome if you're like in operations and you have five different teams, you can set them all into Rancher, like view what's going on mm -hmm. between the teams and try to get maybe a semblance of like a greater policy, let's say, that you yep. want to push down because you have the visualization of all that, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's like the YAML is also there. It's in the end a client for the Kubernetes API. It's not uh, adding anything on top of the Kubernetes API. Everything is in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And I also have access to all the custom resources. If I, I'm using operators, for example, they are also all there here. So for example, I'm using cert manager to manage let's encrypt certificates. So all the cert manager resources are also in here. I can access them as well. And if I want to use kubectl or my IDEs, I can also generate myself a kube config. And the token authentication token in here is then tied to my user in my Active Directory, for example. And it doesn't matter if I use the cluster through the UI or through kubectl. I only have the permissions that I should have depending on the configuration that the admin did. Yeah, so no developer has to ping the admin for a cube uh, config <laughs> certificate or anything crazy like that. No, no they can just go. Gen everyone okay. can generate those themselves. And of course, if the user is off-boarded, then the token that is inside of there is also not valid anymore. Um, so also important because people may leave the company at some point. Yeah, perfect. Uh, whereas if I uh, have a, cl a client certificate authentication at Kubernetes, that one is I probably have to yeah, recreate all the client certificates then. Uh, that or well, yeah, it is a, yeah. a lot harder. From an operational it. standpoint, yeah. it's just a huge time saver, right? Yeah. And actually from a security standpoint, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Definitely. Um there are a couple of other nice nice things in here. I also have a direct integration of an application marketplace. This is in the end a front end for Helm. I can add my Helm repositories also here in the UI. And then if I wanted to install an application, I can yeah, just click on it. Um, let's see which one. Uh, let's maybe, if I wanted to cr install Artifactory, I can click on it and then go through the steps to install the Helm chart directly through a nice intuitive UI instead of having to do everything on the command line. On, on the other hand, if I use the command line, I also see all the installed applications in here as well. So it is, again, a direct connection to what Helm is doing. Um, yeah. And maybe as a last thing on top of that, what can be also really a time saver, especially for operations, especially if you're using not only one cluster, but multiple of them, let's say development, staging, production, maybe multiple development clusters, maybe multiple cluster, clusters on different infrastructures, maybe one for machine learning or so. Rancher also includes a um, global continuous delivery system. Um, that I can use to roll out um, yeah, applications and manifest Helm charts to all my clusters or to some of my clusters in a GitOps way. So centrally within Rancher, I have access to all my clusters. Here are all the three ones that I have at the moment. If I wanted to, I can group the clusters together. So I could say I have one group of dev clusters where all my dev clusters are in, and I can create as many groups as I want. And then I can register Git repositories inside of Rancher directly. And I have prepared one here. Um, this one contains a Hello World application with a deployment and a service. So nothing very special. Um, and if I put in the URL here, I could set up authentication. I could set up TLS settings if that were an inter ex internal Git repository like GitLab that doesn't have a public CA certificate. I can watch the whole repository or maybe only one or multiple subdirectories. And then I can decide to which clusters or cluster groups the content of this repository is uh, deployed to. So let's maybe take the demo cluster here to just pick one. And then if I click Create, Rancher will now start watching the Git repository for changes. And every time something changes in the Git repository, the content of the repository is then also deployed to all attached clusters. 
And as soon as something changes, if I were to change here something in the deployment YAML, it will also be deployed in here. So very useful, for example, if you have 10 clusters and you want to deploy uh, some security demons or some policies to all the clusters and keep that in sync. And of course, it not only supports plain Kubernetes manifests, you can also put Helm charts in there. You can reference other Helm charts. It supports customize. And I can even make customizations depending on the clusters or cluster groups so that I can say, okay, 90% of my manifests or my Helm shot is the same, but a couple values are different cluster by cluster. I can also put in the configurations in there. So that can also be a huge time saver when operating clusters on scale. Um, yeah, and maybe as a last point, oh, I, I heard maybe you have a question. Oh, that. sorry. No, I was <laughs> just going to say that. That's awesome. I didn't. I didn't actually know that. Is this uh, the CD aspect new as a part of two point six? Yeah, that's um, what I was going to ask. It was there already in two point five, but it it was a bit hidden in two point five, and um, it was developed a lot further and has a lot more features now in two point six. Nice. Yeah, I miss this. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and we did a. Uh, I was going to say we did it on the show. We did Weave and we did Argo. So this is mm -hmm. this is great. We've got collect them all. This is, mm. And it's about really like the groups. I don't yeah. know that I saw that in other platforms. Um, Argo is also nice. And actually, um, in a lot of things in Rancher, we try to not reinvent the wheel. For example, for monitoring, we're using Prometheus and Grafana. For log shipping, we are using an operator from Banzai and bundling that and working with them together. So it's, if possible, we are actually trying to put the industry standards in there that everyone is using to make life easier. And when looking at CD, like a year and a half ago, we also, for example, looked at Argo or Flux to see if that would work for our use cases. Um, but we, what we want to enable is to have CD on scale to so that it also works with thousands of clusters. And then it gets a bit more complicated and Argo didn't scale, uh, scale that well, which is also fine. It's not their use case, right? Um, and Argo then has other features that, that also make it very nice. So it depends what you need to do and what you want to do. And then one tool would, is better than the other or not. So um, definitely something to try out if you're using Ranch already. Um, and also um, one thing, um, Rancher, the system is also in oftentimes tries to uh, eat their own dog food or rancher tries to eat its own dog food. So um, this continuous delivery tool is also used internally in rancher to, for example, keep cluster role bindings and stuff like that in sync on scale. So um, it is very, very cool. tight in into how rancher and the whole cluster provisioning works. Awesome. Um, yeah, and maybe one completely new thing that just was released a couple of weeks ago is the integration with our new project Harvester. And Harvester is an HCI tool, so hyperconverged infrastructure that you can run on bare metal servers in an appliance mode. And it gives you uh, the possibility to create virtual machines on a set of servers um, to also easily migrate virtual machines from one server to another. And it also gives you distributed storage and uh, networking and load balancing on top of that. And the interesting thing is, first of all, it's completely open source. And it is ties in very well with Rancher and makes it very easy then to create Kubernetes clusters on top of them. So here we can see the Harvester UI. You can see I have three servers here that are running Harvester with yeah, quite a few resources. Um, you can also see there are a couple of virtual machines already running here and people are currently playing around with this other colleagues. And of course, I can create new virtual machines in here. So I could say I want to have a virtual machines for virtual machine for workload that is not containerized yet, that is running on VMs. Um, for example, like a MySQL database and configure how many CPUs, how much memory I want to give the VM. I can add my SSH keys directly to here. I can configure volumes uh, and disks, uh, disks. I can choose which operating system I want to run on here. I can configure the networking and add one or multiple networks to my virtual machine. Um, so it supports VLANs and everything. Um, and of course, I also can configure cloud in it to install all the packages that I need when booting up in VM. Um, and yeah, that's quite simple and easy. And now my VM gets started. That's one thing. 
Um, of course, it also supports backups for all the VMs. And uh, yeah, I can then, when the VM is started, also migrate it to another node, um, restart it, uh, pause it, and create templates from it, and so on directly from here. Um, but even more interesting, if we go back to Rancher, I connected now Rancher to this Harvester cluster. And if I create a new cluster in here, from within here, um, let's take the RK21. I have also Harvester as an infrastructure provider. I can choose now which Harvester I want to use. So I can also connect multiple Harvester instances to one Rancher management server and can again give the cluster a demo uh, a name and configure the VMs that should be created for this cluster. So very similar to earlier, I can choose the image. Let's take maybe an Ubuntu here. I can choose the network where the VMs should be created in. I can configure then the SSH user for my image. Um, your CPU memory disk space, and I can configure the Kubernetes settings in here, and then click Create, and it directly integrates and will boot up now in a couple of minutes VMs inside Harvester here. Oh, there it's coming, the first well, one. Well, I know what I'm doing the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, and the good thing is Harvester is, like the idea is it's an appliance. Like you get an, you can, if you go to the homepage, you get an ISO, you download it, uh, and you boot up your VM with the ISO, you get an installation wizard. Um, and then a couple minutes later, you have it all running. So you have Harvester running, you have Longhorn as a distributed storage running under this, and um, then you can start using it. So it's like an all in one package. Yeah. And that storage driver as part of Kubernetes is massive as well. I know that yeah. really that has a, completely been solved in the industry. There was a bunch of uh, software vying for it, but yeah, the yeah. Longhorn, it, that's that's huge. You get so, uh, yeah. storage that just gets brought up with your cluster, which is mm -hmm. great. Yeah, and it's automatically also connected. So if I would, this is a cluster I prepared uh, already. This is also running on this Harvester instance. And if I create now a workload here, Let's say again an nginx with an nginx image and if i now create here a load balancer service for port 80 and if i also add some storage to um to this deployment i can choose harvester as a storage class this is automatically created inside of the cluster and I could say I want to have a one gigabyte volume here. And let's mount this just at slash data. Doesn't matter too much. And if I create this, um, this comes out of the box as soon as I create the cluster. I don't have to set up anything additionally. And somewhere here, my Nginx is starting up. And then I automatically also get a persistent volume claim for this Nginx. And this is a volume that is then created in directly in Harvester as a volume. Somewhere here should be now. Uh, I think I think it's uh, ah this one here, thirty one seconds ago. So this is my persistent volume directly here, um, and I also got a load balancer service created. And let's also look for it um, here. Load balancer service and this load balancer service should also yeah have it has a public vip of course this is an it does it's not a public ip address it's a private ip address because the network is not exposed externally we didn't attach any public ip addresses to it um but it it's used it's used a private ip range for vips and under this is actually using cube vip so it's also again not completely invented but directly packaged with harvester and i have directly integrated directly in there which is also awesome. quite nice. Yeah, the, I love the just the workflow seems very uh, refined. It's very cool, intuitive. Yeah, and honestly, it's just for my own use case at home. This is this is perfect. It's having something that's remote that's easy to manage, and you just go and create a Docker container, right? That runs yeah. Rancher on your local station workstation. That's great. Yeah. Are are all these features available just with the 
Rancher version that you can go and pull from the website? Yep, that's the newest Rancher version, two, Rancher version 2.6.3. Um, this is the whole Harvester integration. It's there just on the website. You can install it. And then we'll, we'll send everybody your way when they run into issues. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Very cool. Steve. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. What are you? Uh... I'm, I'm, I was, that was probably the clearest, most successful demo we've ever done on the show. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's so much functionality just in, in so little time. That was really impressive. And, and it, I'm feeling very similar to, to Foster in that. I am doing too many things manually that yeah. I could just do the super easy way. Maybe I just, I love punishment. I love YAML. That's my problem. <laughs> One of the uh, things that changed in 2.6 was, I think it was the apps and marketplace. The, like the marketplace in the old rancher was massive, right? And mm. I think there's, there's been trimmed down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, was there a specific reason for it? Was there like, I know you said that you wanted to get more up to industry standard. Was there sort of a concerted mm -hmm. effort in the marketplace to say, hey, here are the apps that we want to yep. make sure have? Um, so, yeah, so the main reason is the old apps marketplace, um, there was just tons of stuff in there that wasn't maintained that some people at some point submitted. Um, I think there was a WordPress Helm chart in there that didn't get an update for three years or so, and that's not good, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, it's not even someone over our engine, some one of our engineers that submitted it. It was just someone from the community. And then in the early days, someone said, "Oh, that's a good idea to have a WordPress in there. Let's merge it." And then nobody maintained it. Um, so that's why we trimmed it down. Um, we are using now the app marketplace, um, the st or the stuff that it directly ships with the repository that are in here out of the box. There are two of them. One is our own. Um, and we use this to uh, allow you to add additional functionality to each cluster. If you create a cluster, for example, the whole monitoring integration with the alerts that you saw earlier, it's not there. It's not on by default, but you can install the monitoring app to add this functionality to Rancher. Um, reason for that is maybe you're not want, you don't want to use Prometheus in Grafana. You pay Datadog big money. Why would you then run Prometheus in addition in your cluster? You want to deploy the Datadog agent uh, inside of your cluster, and that's it. Um, and in addition, the orange ones here, these are applications that are provided by partners, and that they're then also really vetted that they are maintaining this. Um, mm -hmm. And they one of them is, for example, the Datadog agent, uh, where Datadog says, hey, we want to make it easy for Rancher users to add Datadog to, our, to their clusters. So if they want to deploy the Datadog agent, they click Install. They click Next. Um, they put in uh, the Datadog API key and maybe a couple more things, click Install, and then they have it running. Um, and we w work together with, this, with all these partners to ensure this is working great together. But of course, you can add your um, own additional repositories to here. So if I wanted, to, if I have additional HAM repositories that I want to add to the application make marketplace, I can add a repository. I can add the URL in here and maybe set up authentication if it's a private repository. And then I can also install all the applications directly from here as well. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. I'd be, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Uh, is new vector going to make it into the apps and marketplace anytime soon? That was uh, some big news you guys broke at the end of the year. See right? that. I also see a tab yeah. up there. Hey, wow, there it is. So it is already in the uh, marketplace. I I anticipated the question, so they yeah. already opened it. <laughs> um, so it's already installable, um, and the engineering teams are currently working on making the integration nicer. So new vector will still remain its own product, similar to Longhorn, it's its own product. You can use it without Rancher. Also Harvester, you can use it without Rancher, but we want to make a very nice integration that you have it very easily installed um, and have additional benefits like integrations directly in the UI and so, so mm -hmm. that to make it easier to Those, use. Uh, integrations yeah. into the CI, CD aspect would be pretty, pretty cool too, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, also the whole multi-cluster aspect, because maybe you have a development um, cluster, you already have all your um, firewall rules and um, that you set up a new vector to limit what a container can do, which processes you can run, which other services they can communicate to. You have it already already defined all the policies um, in dev, so you also want to put them into production 
and you don't have to want to, don't want to recreate them. And if you since you have all the information already within Rancher, it makes it yeah a no brainer. It makes it yeah, yeah just, basically a no brainer. You really want to have this. You want to have this connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, you could if like I say you have all your policies in your development group you if you created a new group that just overlapped with other clusters or other clusters yeah. didn't have the agent installed you brought them in those policies would just automatically transfer over to the other cluster right yep definitely it's awesome and also i um i think we announced it directly when we also announced the acquisition new vector also will become open source in the near future wow um, wow cool very so, cool. Since we're every, like Susan is having has been doing open source for thirty nearly thirty years now, um, everything that Susan is doing is open source. Everything thing that Rancher has been doing for the last six years or seven years has been has been open source. So New Vector also will become open source. So you're coming back to uh, demo New Vector when it uh, is open sure. source. We'll be happy to. All right. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. Same. Any last uh, sure. questions, Steve? No, I'm I'm pretty impressed with that. That was that was pretty awesome. Thank you, Bastian. That was great. Uh, Foster, you, you're the rancher guy. No, I answered everything. Now I just got to go uh, play with all the things I've been missing. I didn't realize <laughs> all this functionality. So, yeah, that was great. And did it in more succinct than we ever do it too, Steve. So, that's gotta, that, was, that was that was without question that was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. That was uh, it was a pleasure. A lot of fun. Thank you for having me. That was so cool. To, uh, All right, to lunch now. <laughs> and then go you get to go have lunch. Stuff. We get to go have dinner, um, yep. and I think we we can wrap it up. That's great. Um, so that's the end of the show. If you're watching, my name is Steve Jaguer, Mike Foster, and that's Bastion. And you've been watching. First.